All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Those who are joining us as we speak. Welcome to the Council of the Americas. My name is Francisco Martinez, and I am a senior associate. I'm the head of uh, YPA in Miami. For those of you joining us for the very first time, YPA is the Young Professionals of the Americas. This is the Young Leaders Initiative of the Council of the Americas, uh, where we convene the rising stars of multinationals, multilatinas, organizations across business sectors, public and private, who share a uh, common interest in public policy, business, investment, and culture of our region. Today's program is very special because it is the first one of our uh, YPA Crypto 101 series, which is uh, set to be dedicated to the transformative power of the technologies underlying blockchain, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, and everything in between that's driving growth and investment while rapidly changing the very nature of our global markets, our region, and of course, sooner rather than later, our own pockets. Uh, we seek to capture the interest of those who may find value in learning about these technologies, but doing so in a simple, plain English 101 style. That's where we're striving for. Now, uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank our YPA Global sponsors, the BMW Group and BlackRock. You know, their support is uh, to our network is critical and it allows to carry our mission forward. Should you or your company be interested in supporting the young professionals of the Americas, we are always open and welcome uh, to your sponsorship. This includes uh, having some of your young leaders involved in our board of directors, and especially it includes an opportunity to incorporate some of uh, your company priorities into our YPA programmatic agenda. Feel free to reach me at fmartinez at as-coa.org if you have any questions on that. Well, now that business is up, I'd lastly, I'd like to thank, especially thank the NYU Stern School of Business for their great partnership and support, and very specially to our guest of honor, Professor David Yermak. Joining me today as uh, the co-chair of this program is uh, Monica Ramirez Garellano. She's a senior manager at Restaurant Brands International. She is a Wharton Business School MBA graduate and is a um, Juris Doctor from NYU School of Law. She is, of course, a member of the board of directors of YPA here in Miami, and I am so thankful. We are so thankful for her support and for her leadership helping put together this program. Monica, welcome and on to you. Thank you, Francisco. Good morning. It is my honor to introduce Professor David Yermak. When the steering committee began to brainstorm on topics that are cutting edge and relevant to the ever changing landscape of Latin America. We felt strongly about hosting a conversation on the role of cryptocurrencies and digital assets in the region. Professor Yermak's leadership in teaching one of the first Bitcoin courses at a business school, especially back in 2015, made this invitation a necessity. Professor Yermak is the Albert Fingerhut Professor of Finance and Business Transformation at NYU Stern School of Business. He serves as chairman of the Finance Department and director of the NYU Pollock Center for Law and Business. Professor Yermak teaches joint MBA and law school courses in restructuring firms and industries and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, as well as PhD research courses in corporate governance, executive compensation, and distress and restructuring courses. He has been with NYU Stern since 1994, and his primary research areas include board of directors, executive compensation, and corporate finance. Professor Yermak has published more than 25 articles in leading academic journals in finance, accounting, economics, and law. He is a faculty research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and has been a leading scholar at the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. He is a graduate of Harvard University for his AB, MBA, JD, and Master's and PhD in Business Economics. We are delighted to have you join us, Professor Yermak. And we look forward to your presentation and perspectives. On to you, Francisco. 
Thank you so much, Monica. Okay, let's get started. Uh, today's dynamic is uh, very simple. Professor Yarmak will begin with his presentation. And during the presentation, we do encourage uh, your questions through the chat, either sharing them uh, with everyone or uh, sending a direct chat to my colleague, colleague Marvin, Marvin Willey. Now, after the presentation, we will open it up for an interactive Q&A. And at this time, you may request to speak by uh, raising your hand virtually. When recognized, you may unmute your microphones and, uh, and share your comments uh, or questions with the group. Or you may also continue to ask questions on the chat. We do strongly encourage uh, everyone to participate. However, as a reminder, this is a private by invitation only program, uh, but it will be recorded and posted on our ASCOA web website. Uh, Please keep your microphone silenced to avoid interference and only unmute yourself when you're recognized to speak. And we'll try to end the conversation at 11 a.m. sharp to be mindful of everyone's time. Professor Yermak, thank you again. We have a terrific group, uh, not just YPA, but uh, a handful of Council of the Americas corporate members and board members. And we just expect a terrific interaction. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to be here and the fact that we have such a good turnout today. So thank you all for joining. And I think I should also mention at the outset that my wife is from Peru, that I've been, for family reasons, a close observer of the financial culture of South America. I've actually taught a course at the Superintendency of Banking in Peru. And um, it's it's a very interesting time. You know, it's always been a region where there have been financial challenges, but what we're going to talk about today, in fact, let me just begin my screen share, is the um, the increasing incursion of cryptocurrency and digital assets. So I've been teaching a course since 2014 at NYU with some colleagues from the law school. And when we began now seven years ago, um, we were regarded as something of a fringe operation. We weren't even sure that students would sign up for this. And we were subject to a fair amount of ridicule from our colleagues. And I think we had about 33 students the first time out, but the course grew very quickly. And we now have hundreds of students. We offer the course multiple times a year. There are shorter versions for executive programs and so forth. But the topic has become very central to the financial system to the point that the central banks themselves are now considering whether to either create their own cryptocurrencies, as China is now in the process of doing, or to adopt other cryptos that are currently in circulation. So a real important moment occurred in June when, for the first time, a country declared Bitcoin to be legal tender. So I think, as you all probably are aware, this was El Salvador. and they gave really a very short window to ramp up and begin this. The, um, the legislation, I think, was signed into law on the 7th of June, and in about a month, on, this, on the 7th of September, all of the shops and merchants and vendors in El Salvador must accept Bitcoin if it's presented for payment. Um, El Salvador also has used the U.S. dollar as a legal tender for many years. They um, at the moment do not have a functioning sovereign currency. But the fact that this decentralized cryptocurrency has been adopted legally by a country is, you know, just, I still find it somewhat astonishing, but it speaks to the success and the worldwide importance that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have achieved. So I'm going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes and give an overview of how this works and raise some of the issues that I think are going to be important for the adoption of this. And let me begin with um, just a little bit of history. Bitcoin began in late 2008. Um, a person or maybe a group of people using this name Satoshi Nakamoto posted a white paper to a cryptography bulletin board on the internet. And only a small group of specialists would have even been aware of this. But they found the ideas and the technology behind this impressive. Some people volunteered to help Satoshi code up this and launch it. And one of the things I find remarkable is how quickly this was actually introduced. The white paper, which you can see on the left, was posted on Halloween, on, on October 31st of 2008. And barely eight weeks later, on January 3rd, 2009, 
the network went live and very famously on the very first transaction that crossed on the Bitcoin blockchain, Satoshi included the headline from that morning's Times of London, which you can see on the right. And the headline was that the chancellor in the UK was on the brink of bailing out the banking system for the second time. This was at the very bottom of the financial crisis in January of 2009. And Satoshi wrote that headline, Chancellor on Brink of Second Bailout for Banks, attached it to the first transaction, partly as a proof of date, proof of life kind of thing, so that everyone could look back and know for sure what the date was. But I think it was more of a challenge or a taunt to history that this is a new financial system. We won't have bailouts. In fact, we won't even have banks in this system. And the logic of this was that people could all have wallets on a computer network and simply pay each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without having to go through a bank or a clearinghouse or a mint or any central node of the system that would typically be used to settle accounts and validate the transactions. So this started you know, very, very small in January of 2009 with only a few specialists connected to it. If you look at the network today, there's about 10,000 nodes around the world and you can see that you can find them on every continent. They are more concentrated in Western Europe and in the east and west of the United States than anywhere else, but quite a few in China, Australia, and some presence in the developing world as well. The nodes do the work of essentially keeping the books, relaying traffic and transactions and so forth. And anybody who wishes can join and be a node. In fact, the number changes minute to minute. Anybody with an internet connection in the world, any place at all, could um, volunteer essentially and help do the work of the network. And anybody anywhere, you don't have to be a node to hold a wallet. And there are at this point several million people who have wallets that are connected to the network. And this runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's never been hacked or taken down in more than 12 years. It's um, widely regarded as the most secure computer network that has ever been developed. The remarkable thing about it, though, is that nobody's in charge. Um, there is no central node. There's no leader, board of directors, or you know, any type of command structure. All of these 10,000 nodes, in principle, are equal, and they're all watching and checking on the work of one another on a real-time basis. What the security really relies upon is the mutual surveillance of the work of all the nodes by one another. And if somebody tries to cook the books or change a transaction, they simply get excluded and ignored by the very large majority of honest nodes who are doing the work correctly. And it's a very different way of thinking about security, of essentially crowdsourcing the job of the auditor, where in this network, everybody's an auditor and everybody has the ability to not only watch everybody else, but to ignore them if they think that they are lying or cheating or trying to commit fraud of some type. So the people who actually run these nodes, a, a subset of them are called the miners who actually do the work of updating the ledger. The ledger is known as the blockchain. Each block has about 2,400 Bitcoin transactions, give or take. And a block occurs in a regular interval, which is about every 10 minutes. And the miners will compete with one another to essentially solve a puzzle that comprises the block. And the miner who wins the block gets a reward, which currently is equal to 6.25 Bitcoin. So if you follow this area, you probably know that Bitcoin right now is trading for about $38,000. And so if you decide you want to be a miner and anybody, in fact, could enter this competition and you happen to win the next block, the prize that you get is 6.25 times 38,000. It's about 250,000 US, which is essentially up for competition every 10 minutes. So, you know, why are there 10,000 people doing this work? It's because many of them are trying to win that prize that's available six times per hour. And the incentives are really the source of the stability of the network. What Nakamoto has done here is really use some simple applications of game theory to get people to compete for this reward every 10 minutes 
and not only to do the work needed to solve the puzzles to update the blockchain, but especially to watch the work of everybody else, to make sure that everyone is playing by the rules and behaving honestly. And given the immense size of the rewards, you know, a quarter of a million dollars every 10 minutes, it's more than enough to get people to um, not only join this, but to play fairly and to provide indirectly the security of the entire operation. Now, before we get any deeper, I want to just call everyone's attention to the second bullet point, which is that a block is every 10 minutes or every 600 seconds, if you will, and it can hold about 2,400 transactions. And if we simply divide 2,400 by 600 seconds, that means that four people per second can use this network worldwide. Now, how many people live in El Salvador? I think it's about 7 million. And, you know, just assume that these people want to use the network one time per day, which is probably conservative. Um, there is nowhere near enough capacity to accommodate even a very small country. And I want to talk more about this, but I think the people who began Bitcoin 12 years ago had no idea how quickly it would grow. And what has failed to occur is any type of plan for upgrading and scaling the thing to accommodate more capacity. Um, there are transaction fees that are essentially the product of an auction that you have to essentially pay to be on the blockchain. And right now, the fee for one transaction, I checked right before I connected, it's about $9 US if you wish to join this and, and simply you know buy coffee or pay for groceries or whatever. And I think $9 probably exceeds the daily income by a very large margin of most people in El Salvador. So the idea that this will actually be widely used as legal tender, I think is really quite fanciful. And we'll talk about some of the workarounds that might be used instead. Let me come back though to the miners and the work that they do. What happens is that the mining rewards, which are currently six and a quarter Bitcoin every 10 minutes, these also account for the creation of new coins. And so the growth of the Bitcoin money supply can be mapped out very precisely. Um, if you go all the way back to the beginning, the reward was actually 50 Bitcoins for every block that was mined every 10 minutes. And the rules of the network are that every four years, that reward gets cut by 50%. So if you look at this graph here, which simply shows the cumulative growth of the Bitcoin in circulation, you can see that the slope falls by half every four years in a very regular pattern. And ultimately, there will be only 21 million Bitcoin issued. And where we are today in 2021, you've already got about 19 million out of the 21 million in circulation. So all of those have entered the system by way of a miner who won the coins and then at some point sold them or spent them or passed them on to somebody else. But what many people find attractive about this is that you've got a very precise rule about money creation. And if you think about what goes wrong in most central banks, they print too much money. They inflate the currency. They, um, rather than having the government balance the books and collect taxes, they simply pay the bills by printing more money. And what people like about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is that you don't have human judgment or discretion you simply have very precise mathematical rules. I'm not sure that these are good rules. Like if you ask me what's the optimal rate of money creation, I'm not sure I would have said cut it by 50% every four years and you know, do what the Bitcoin people have done. But on the other hand, since there's complete clarity about what the rules are, people can plan for them and work around them. And I think a lot of the people who are enthusiasts and adopters of cryptocurrency really see the value in the controlled scarcity. You know, the fact that the money supply is known with certainty about what it's going to be into the future. And in that sense, people sometimes think of it as an equivalence to gold or some other safe asset where you don't have to worry about explosions in the supply going forward. Now, what do the miners actually do? Um, typically, even though you could do this at home with your laptop, most of the people who play this game are running data centers where they have specially designed equipment, um, typically thousands of these mining units in a warehouse that is, um, it appears to be run by people in jeans and leather jackets. 
But what they're trying to do is solve these cryptographic problems that you need to win a block on the blockchain. And the only way to solve them is by trial and error. So what these little machines do, and they do it trillions of times per minute, is simply guess random numbers and plug them into mathematical functions and see if they can discover a solution. This is pure work with no social purpose. But the system is called proof of work because if you actually win a block, it means that you must have guessed trillions or maybe quadrillions of solutions until you found one that, that works. And that represents a show of commitment to the network. The fact that you made the investment of resources and time to do all that work must mean that you care about the integrity of the books, that you have a lot at stake, if you will, that if, if you weren't doing this work honestly and were ignored by all the other people who were, in fact, doing the right calculations, you would have to write off a very large investment like these guys have made. And where these people tend to locate is far north. I've, in fact, circled in green where I think the sweet spot is. Um, a problem you have with all these machines is that you need to keep them cool. And so putting them up in northern Quebec or places like um, Iceland, the Scandinavian countries and so forth, typically gives you access not only to cold weather, but wind or hydropower so that you can get very cheap energy. And it's also good to be in a country with a skilled labor force who, where you can get IT technicians to help with the machinery. And one other point that you need is fairly benign regulation. Um, you could, in principle, put these things in Siberia, where I think the geography would be very favorable. But there's one big problem in Siberia, which is Putin. Um, you have an autocratic government that has a long history of expropriating the wealth of successful businesses. So nobody wants to invest in Siberia. Um, you may know that until recently, many of the miners were in China, and you can still see this on this map. Um, it's a weird accident that led to this happening, where there were distortions in the energy market in China, where people could get electricity for free. Um, the Chinese government, though, as of this summer, has expelled the miners, and they are now looking for new places to go. And I think many of them are likely to end up in northern Canada and northern Scandinavia, because in the long run, the, um, the geographic conditions are optimal there. You can also see, though, that Venezuela has been the host of a fair number of crypto miners. And that's because the brilliant dictator Maduro has given free electricity to the people. And one of the inputs to this is the electrical bill. Um, typically, a mine like this would pay tens of thousands of dollars per month for electricity. But if Maduro wants to give it away for free, people will bring the hardware there, even though you can't get food in Caracas. The fact that you can get energy there is very attractive. And so you do see a lot of crypto mining taking place in Venezuela. But I think in the long run, of course, that's not going to be sustained by the market. They'll eventually have to charge for electrical power. And the, um, the Bitcoin miners are likely to migrate either to the north or maybe to places like Texas, where there's a lot of wind power. And you're seeing the construction of a lot of crypto mines right now. So. Venezuela has become fairly well known, not just for the presence of miners, but because there's a fairly wide use of Bitcoin, not only in the local domestic consumer market, but also for remittances from abroad. Um, Venezuela is a case of a country with essentially a failed banking system, but there are many Venezuelans abroad who wish to send money home to support family members. And you can do it easily by way of the Bitcoin network. I, in fact, have a colleague who teaches at the London School of Economics, where he's a professor. His mother's in Venezuela. I think she's 80 some years old. And he hooked her up to the Bitcoin network because he wasn't able to send money home any longer through the regular banking channels. And there's fairly wide adoption. Um, I'm going to show on my last slide the ranking of leading countries for Bitcoin adoption, and this is done by Chainalysis, which is one of the um, very sophisticated crypto consulting firms. And you see that Venezuela comes in third, but many of the other countries, um, Kenya, Ukraine, Nigeria, Colombia, and so forth, Vietnam, many of these are emerging markets where the costs of remittances and the liquidity of the regular financial system has faced many challenges over time. And they've essentially turned to cryptocurrency as a functional substitute. 
which um, you know has promoted the adoption. A country like Vietnam, for instance, stands out as um, you know an economy that's been fairly well managed and has grown very quickly, but has nevertheless found a lot of demand for the use of crypto as an alternative to the financial system. And um, I think that we're going to only see more of this in the years ahead. El Salvador has gone much further than any of these other countries by actually making it legal and you know, openly encouraging people to do this. But I think the point needs to be made that all of these countries are typically dealing with cryptocurrency through a third party exchange of some type, which is providing custody and settlement services that go above and beyond what you would get from just connecting to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, if you want to be a direct user of Bitcoin, again, only four people per second can do this worldwide. There is a transaction fee that rises and falls based on demand, but currently it's about $9 per transaction. And so I think almost everybody in these countries who's actually using Bitcoin doesn't realize it, but they're probably using a synthetic version through something such as the Lightning Network or some other third party provider. And the safety and the security that they are getting is only as good as that third party itself. And I think in the long run, if I go back to my title slide with El Salvador, you're going to have a lot of kiosks and small bodegas and so forth who may be accepting Bitcoin, but they will probably be channeling their transactions through some local provider. And there's going to be a need to regulate and monitor and ensure the solvency of these third parties who are now going to become suddenly much more important. And I don't know if the, the local government is really going to be up to that task. I think many of the problems that you might have had in the regular banking system will simply be recreated in what is suddenly going to be a very new financial system that will have indirect connections to cryptocurrency. But um, I think is going to cause a lot of challenges and side effects that, that can only be speculated about until this begins to go live in September. But it will be very interesting to watch and is certainly a um, you know important turning point or inflection point in the history of all this. So I think I've probably talked long enough and you know let me take down my screen share at this point. And we have a little more than a half hour for discussion and Q&A. And so I would you know, welcome questions from the audience at this point. Absolutely, David. Thank you so much. What a what a thorough and insightful presentation. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it very much. Um, I I'll probably kick it off and uh, and encourage everyone. If you uh, have a question, you know, please feel free to uh, write on the chat, and we'll uh, recognize you, and you can get go ahead and, and unmute yourself to share a comment or a question. Um, David, I, I just want to touch on the um, the subject of of legitimacy. Um, well, as it relates to Bitcoin, of course, you know, any successful currency and you said it well, you know, requires um, sort of massive sustainable adoption um, for those who are using it. You know, just last night when I sent the reminder email for this very program, Outlook notified me that my email might be uh, flagged as phishing or scam. Because not because I use the link or anything else, but because I use the word Bitcoin on my email. So speaks volumes to this to 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 the legitimacy of Bitcoin and how um, you know, how it's affecting the uh, the ability or will affect the ability uh, for it to be sustainable. So I guess your thoughts on this issue of legitimacy, you know, vis vis a vis Bitcoin and how. Legitimacy or lack thereof might affect the prospects of global economic sustainable adoption. So, you know, there's a couple things I would pick up on in your question. And again, the, the El Salvador case is so important because it's really the first time that the so called legitimacy has been conferred by a sovereign government. Um, in most countries, it's not illegal to issue your own money. So, you know, in the United States, there's all kinds of local currencies in places like Ithaca, New York, and the Berkshire regions of Massachusetts and in California. And mostly these are simply ignored by governments because they never grow very big and expand beyond the local areas. But Bitcoin is obviously different and it's caused governments to reconsider whether there shouldn't be limits or at least indirect regulation. 
And even today, there are bills pending in the US Congress that would begin to impose some national restrictions. It, it's not clear if these things will pass or even are legal under the US Constitution, but you're beginning to see many countries get concerned enough about crypto to think about whether they wanna put it in a box or put boundaries around it. Now, why was your message flagged for potential phishing? There are a lot of scams in the crypto area, not involving crypto itself, but, but promoters who pretend to be offering it for sale. And I think most famously, the ransomware attacks where people often ask for Bitcoin payments and ransom. This has gotten the attention of a lot of people in you know, the FBI and in the cybersecurity area. Um, it's important to realize that the hacks and the scams are not emitting from the Bitcoin network itself. In fact, quite to the contrary, Bitcoin is so safe and secure that even criminals feel that they can use it and not have to worry about the money being stopped or confiscated or anything like that. And I think, you know, the attraction of this to um, what appear to be networks of Eastern European and North Korean hackers, um, the attractiveness as a method of payment to them, I think, is indirectly a real endorsement of its security and its success. But it definitely has um, gotten people on watch lists that if you say that you accept Bitcoin, people may ask questions about, are you trying to launch a ransomware attack? Are you a drug dealer? Are you you know, doing all kinds of other evil things on the internet, human trafficking or what have you, because there certainly have been cases where the cryptocurrency has been used for this purpose. That's, thank you so much for that. We, have, we actually have a, a, a few uh, requests for questions. We have yeah. uh, Tim Jacklick. Tim, go ahead and unmute yourself. Great, thanks so much. And uh, David, thank you so much for this, this presentation. This is fascinating. Um, my question, so first off, so I, I study cryptocurrency in Latin America at a, at a company called America's Market Intelligence. So I right. was, thrilled, was thrilled to see this, this presentation taking place. So my question for you is, um, so we certainly are seeing a you know, wide adoption of different crypto assets throughout the LATAM region, um, particularly you know, in, in the larger markets for similar purposes as in the United States. You know, people want to get a return as crypto goes to the moon. But especially as we think about, you know, ordinary Latin American consumers, um, I wonder whether stable coins, especially those that are linked to, um, you know, monies that are more stable than domestic currencies, I wonder whether those will end up, you know, taking, uh, taking on more of an importance for, you know, your ordinary consumer uh, so my first question is, do you agree? And then second question is, how do you think that relates? Or I guess, do you think that, you know, dollarized stable coins can last in, in the era to come of CBDCs? And David, if you, yeah. if you may expand also on the definition of a stable coin for those who are unfamiliar. Sure. So a stable coin is a coin that tries to replicate a real asset. And by far the most popular are the US dollar stable coins. And, and the largest of that group is known as Tether. But there's a growing family of these, the, the USD coin and so forth. Other stable coins, some are connected to currencies. So there's a Euro stable coin, a Swiss franc, Australian dollar, you know, you, and anyone who wants could really create one of these. But the high demand is for the US dollar coins. Others, though, are tied to things like gold or there was even a Tesla stable coin where a, essentially one coin was a synthetic share of stock in Tesla. And the promoters of that got in trouble for essentially selling unregistered securities. You know, if you wanted, you could do that, but you need to register with the securities regulator and so forth. But um, stable coins replicate real assets. And I think it's obvious to see that there would be demand for US dollar payments, because the US dollar is much more stable than most currencies. But on the other hand, why not use the US dollar itself? I'm not sure, you know, what need would be met by a crypto stablecoin that you couldn't simply meet by, um, it, it's not like there's a shortage of dollars, you know, there's a couple trillion of them circulating around the world and, and vastly more outside the US than inside. So I would think this would only make sense if there was some liquidity issue with the local banking system that for whatever reason, you couldn't get dollars into the country. Um, but I, I don't see that stable coins themselves 
are going to be widely used. The, the main use of them seems to be for settling crypto transactions on crypto platforms. So for people who want to speculate, not just in Bitcoin, but maybe in the 10,000 other digital assets that are out there, it's convenient to have Tether and other assets available as a medium of exchange and as a store of value that is more stable than some other crypto assets, such as Bitcoin. But I don't think stable coins are going to circulate widely in the real economy with the big qualification that the central banks themselves are going to be issuing their own crypto. So there's going to be like a real US dollar crypto asset. And that probably you know, will begin to circulate in the next five years. Um, the Chinese are already doing this with a crypto rim NIMBY. And I think it would be the sovereign stable coins if you want, or the CBDCs themselves, central bank digital currencies, that would eventually come into wide demand. What's interesting is that the central banks feel the need to do this, that the success of crypto has advanced to the point that the central banks are doing this really from a defensive posture to, to maintain user engagement with their own sovereign currencies. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with all of that. Um, I think in, in, in Latin America specifically, the, the angle that I think uh, stable coins are, are filling right now is, especially in markets like Argentina, where you have capital controls. And so you do have a limit on yeah. the dollars that are able to be purchased. Um, but, you know, will that, will that last in the era of CBDCs? Anyone's guess. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think capital flight is an interesting issue. And that is why I think the miners in China were so numerous is that people were actually using Bitcoin to get money out of China. And that's why the Chinese cracked down on it. Um, but capital flight is a very different issue than day to day consumption needs, you know, buying groceries, paying your rent and so forth. And, and stems issues of illicit trade also um, and, and many others. Uh, uh, David, we have a question now from uh, from Brendan O'Boyle. Brendan, take it away. Hey, thanks so much. Um, my name is Brendan O'Boyle. I'm an editor at Early. I write about Latin American politics, and I'm really interested in the politics of crypto in Latin America. And there's no shortage of uh, enthusiasts uh, who look to El Salvador as sort of like a sign of a, a wave of crypto in Latin America. But of course, El Salvador is an outlier in many ways. Um, like many of the countries you mentioned, Russia, Venezuela, the democratic outlier, but also in other ways, um, the size of its economy, the fact that it uses the dollar. Can you speak to the hunger for uh, within Latin American politics for moving towards crypto? Is there a realistic, um, can we expect to see politicians actually consider this? Yeah, you know, I, I've written a lot about the ability of crypto to provide a check on the central bank because typically, you know, El Salvador is different because they don't have a sovereign currency, but the large majority of countries, you would see essentially a competition between the crypto asset and the government's own currency. And this is not a new thing. Um, you know, there have been illegal black markets often for U.S. dollars from the beginning of time in most countries. You know, I, mean, I remember going to Russia in the 1980s when it was still under the rule of the Communist Party and there was an official exchange rate of rubles for dollars, but there was also the black market exchange rate, which was 10 times higher. And that was really the only currency that you could use to buy any goods of quality in Russia. So competition between currencies has always existed. And I think the competition with crypto is really based on the mathematical control of the money supply that I had that slide about 10 or 15 minutes ago. What a lot of people find attractive about crypto is that there is guaranteed stability. And this essentially would force the central banks of countries where crypto circulates to maintain some degree of monetary discipline even more than the US dollar. I think you know the dollar has justifiably come under some criticism. In the current pandemic, there's been incredible you know, flooding of the market with liquidity from the central bank. There has been attempts by the last government to really appoint some unqualified people to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve. There's been a lot of skepticism about the durability of the US dollar, and I think for perfectly good reasons. 
And so people are looking beyond the dollar to maybe crypto being an asset that will be stable in the longer term. In fact, every central bank in the history of the world has collapsed sooner or later, really except for two, which are the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve. But I think even those two will eventually, you know, be overtaken by world events and so forth. You have to have a very long perspective to realize that central banks are political institutions that sooner or later always collapse. Bitcoin and other cryptos are different. You're putting your trust in mathematics as opposed to in the human discipline and, and the political oversight of these institutions. And I think you know, a lot of the enthusiasts find this attractive, not necessarily as something that should be used for 100% of the transactions, but as something that would introduce a, a source of competition, a, a benchmark for comparison, if you will, for the central bank. And it would force the monetary authority to exercise some restraint. Um, it's, it's very threatening in its own way to the autonomy of governments. And I think you know, this is why some countries have tried to exclude it. But on the other hand, it may promote economic activity and investment simply by being present in the market. And that's a very interesting trade-off for governments to think about. And, and on, it's probably why Venezuela continues to tolerate it, for instance. And, and on that same point about uh, it being threatening, David, um, isn't it threatening also through the financial sector? I mean, uh, this talks of the the now up-and-coming uh, uh, gov coins, uh, governments issuing their own uh, currencies may drive a significant amount of, of resources out of the financial system and into these gulf coins. So could you speak to those uh, challenges as well from the uh, from them affecting the private sector, specifically the financial sector? Yeah, it's it's really quite interesting that um, the first blueprints for central bank digital currency began to circulate not long after Bitcoin was launched. So by 2012, 2013, there was a group within the Bank of England called the Future of Money Team that said we could issue a digital pound and have a national blockchain run by the central bank. And every citizen could simply have a wallet on that network and bank directly at the central bank. In other words, they wouldn't need Barclays and NatWest and all the other UK banks. And the, the logical extension of all this is that the fractional reserve retail banking system really is no longer necessary in a world of central bank crypto. And, you know, in my country, we have four big banks. There's Chase and Citi and Bank of America and Wells Fargo. And every month, my paycheck happens to go into Bank of America. This is a bank that failed three times in the financial crisis 12 years ago. I'd much rather bank at the Federal Reserve. And I think it's quite possible that people will have this opportunity that payments will be made directly on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without commercial banks being involved. And this leaves open the question of where credit will come from. You know, banks take deposits, but then they make loans. And so if I need a mortgage or a car loan or a student loan to go to university, where would I get that? And I think you're going to see other groups called shadow banks grow into these markets and fill these voids. So in the United States today, the leading mortgage lender is not a bank at all. It's a company called Quicken Loans that has figured out a way to process applications quicker and they fund themselves not with consumer deposits, but with long-term debt and equity. So they avoid many of the risks and instabilities that have been for thousands of years part of the banking system. This is a really big topic, but I think what it implies is that you really won't need banks in the future. And that was the whole point of Nakamoto's, you know, the, the chancellor on brink of second bailout for the banking system. We're not going to have a banking system, There's not going to be any bailouts because we won't need banks. And I think these are incredibly challenging ideas, but um, there's huge opportunity here to, um, you know, either do away with the banks altogether or to have them performing much more limited roles where the risks of bank runs and bailouts and the need for deposit insurance and so forth will be a thing of the past. It's a problem that people have been trying to solve since the time of the Romans. And um, after 2000 years, it seems like Nakamoto might have led us in a direction that you know, could really solve some very long standing financial and economic problems. It's, you know, it's both very challenging, but also very hopeful for people who to watch this area closely. 
Absolutely fascinating. Can I, I cannot fathom a, a world without banks and, and, and that might be at the, uh, the edge of the corner. Yeah, no, think about, you know, how much do you really like your bank? <laughs> would, would you miss them if they were gone? I think the greatest problem in getting rid of the banks is that there would be a lot of unemployed bankers but they would need to find something else to do. And you know, this is not the first time that an industry has been overtaken by a new technology and people have, um, you know, used to be a lot of people who made film at Kodak. And once digital photography came in, they all found other jobs doing in some other industry. And I think bankers may be in that position sooner than they may realize. Accountants too, by the way, and, and a number of other professions. But fascinating. Um, the, the, the next question we got is from uh, Renard. Renard, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, the presentation was definitely really informative. Uh, the thing that I actually wanted to ask about was regarding the view of cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, in relation to like bankruptcy issues. Uh, I know that there was recently a case where there is debate over whether it was viewed as a commodity or a currency or even a property. And I know that could have like longstanding ramifications, especially in a commodity market, both domestically and internationally. And I was wondering where the US stood with that and how that can impact uh, the currency in the future. It, it's a very interesting area. So. Yeah, you had brought up the point of bankruptcy, and let me come to that in a moment. But the more general point of whether it should be treated as a commodity or a security or some other asset, you have more than 200 countries trying to come to grips with that. And I think the right answer to that question is none of the above, that this is a new type of property. The security comes from cryptography. It does not look very much like a security at all. There's no voting rights or cash flows that you get from it. It doesn't look much like a commodity either, um, but it is an asset. And since it's an asset, it's typically going to be taxable if you have a capital gain, if you buy it and then sell it at a higher price. Um, I think it's completely rational and shouldn't surprise anyone that the government would wish to, to measure that profit and collect the tax. And in terms of the day-to-day -day trading and the reassignment in cases of default and so forth, we really need to have new regulations written for cases like that. So bankruptcy is one such case where, you know, what if a company goes bankrupt and it happens to hold Bitcoin on the balance sheet as an asset? Uh, do those Bitcoin go to the creditor? Do you value them as of the date of the bankruptcy or as of the date of the transfer? And probably the hardest question of all is how do you get the private keys, which are the codes that are actually needed to transfer them? You know, it's one thing for the court to say these Bitcoin now belong to the creditors who didn't get paid, but to actually get control of the codes from the original owner and to reassign them is sometimes impossible to achieve. So with traditional financial assets, there's usually a broker or a custodian or a bank that can be counted on to, to make that transfer. But with crypto assets, that's by no means the case. Um, an even bigger problem comes from the law of inheritance. What if somebody dies and everybody dies sooner or later? And let's say they own millions of dollars of Bitcoin. Uh, do those Bitcoin go to their next of kin? And again, how do you get the private keys to move them from the wallet of the deceased person into the um, wallet of their heirs? Um, these are very new questions, but in time, they're going to become very, very important. And you're going to see maybe a lot of litigation, but very clear problems in enforcement in you know, actually affecting the transfer of these assets. Um, for the students who take my course in New York, there's a lot of jobs waiting to bring these cases in court and argue both sides of, you know, and th there's a whole new area of the law and of regulation just beginning to open up. And you can just go down the checklist of, you know, bankruptcy and trusts and estates and inheritance, uh, divorces, you know, what do you do with the Bitcoin in a divorce, um, consumer fraud, all of these areas of the law are going to need to accommodate themselves to this new type of property. And you're only beginning to see some of that occur. Fascinating. And and, and I think we uh, we can all cross and 
your expertise and the, the leading institution like NYU uh, in the law and, and for Stern Business School for that to be, um, you know, those, those kinds of yeah. issues. Yeah, we're pretty solved. good at identifying the questions, but many of these questions, the answers are far from clear. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Uh, we're going to give now uh, um, Monica Ramirez de Arellano the, um, the word. Go ahead and ask your question, Monica. Thank you, Francisco. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation, uh, David. Uh, when you were talking about the El Salvador example, you mentioned that since the transactions are, are super slow and, and pretty not feasible from a point of view of a, every person every day doing a transaction, uh, you mentioned that third parties will eventually sort of jump in to, to fit that need. What have you uh, sort of read or concluded that might happen in the short term? And then what do you think should be more of a long term solution kind of ideal role for third parties to to jump in and, and kind of make this Bitcoin transaction a reality? If at all, so I think the vast majority of people around the world who engage with crypto are using a third party. So in the United States. Probably everybody on the call knows that Coinbase is the leading such company. And Coinbase has several million customers. And on any given day, some of them are buying, some of them are selling. And what Coinbase really does is just move coins between their wallets without actually going onto the Bitcoin blockchain. You know, if you want to sell and I want to buy, they'll just debit your account and credit mine. And ultimately, we would both be relying on Coinbase to have enough liquidity to be honest in the record keeping and not to engage in what is called a rug pool. A rug pool is where the rug gets pulled out from under the customers and the promoters just disappear. Now, in the US, we have pretty robust consumer protection law. We know who the Coinbase managers are. It's you know led by a guy named Brian Armstrong who used to work for Goldman Sachs and has got a very high public profile. They have registered with the NASDAQ stock market and gone public. In other words, there's a lot of layers of both reputational and consumer protection for Coinbase in the US. This is not going to be true of service providers in South America in poor countries with small economies. Um, ultimately, they will have to establish credibility by honest behavior. The reputation will probably count for more than the government regulation. There's going to be real interesting questions about whether foreign third parties, like could Coinbase go into other countries, or would they want to protect the domestic financial markets from foreign investor, which is a very common theme in developing countries, that you want to keep foreign institutions from dominating the entire landscape. But ultimately, the security and success of the market will rely upon these third party providers having both the motivation and the resources to provide liquidity and meet the needs of their customer bases. And this is a big challenge, even in the best of circumstances. I've seen that in El Salvador, they've approached the World Bank for assistance in creating on very short notice, a network of reliable service providers. And I think the World Bank very rationally said, no, we don't wanna to touch this and get involved to, now, they don't want to drag their own reputation into the situation, but this is um, it's going to be a big challenge for essentially enough service providers with credibility to fill the demand for transactions that I think is going to emerge very quickly in El Salvador. Inevitably, things will go wrong, and I think the um, reputational damage will probably be attributed partly to the government, partly to Bitcoin itself, and probably to some of the third parties, there's likely to be people who are playing honestly in the market, but also likely to be promoters and scammers and Ponzi schemers of different types. Um, it will be really interesting to watch, but I, I don't think people should be so naive and utopian not to expect things to go wrong. That's correct. Um, and, and, and David, if I may also, there's a, there's another question from um, that was sent privately. Uh, they say many countries globally are uh, pursuing their own coins, uh, which we spoke about a little bit uh, about. But uh, they, they specifically ask about the value of a regional coin, uh, like in the EU, and and also uh, for you to provide 
perhaps some perspectives of um, coins uh, related to this to uh, DM, such as Libra, that's uh, pursued by Facebook, uh, and where you see perhaps, and, and this is an expansion of that question, where do you see uh, companies like Facebook, like Amazon, uh, what's it st what's stopping them from creating, uh, you know, these their own currencies and perhaps even becoming, um, you know, the new banks. So these are two really important points. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons from the Euro that within the Euro area, there are clearly countries and these are generally the Northern countries that have benefited from the regional currency at the expense of the Southern countries. And the reason that the Germans have bailed out the Greeks so many times is because the system is kind of rigged in favor of the Germans and they want to keep it going. So I think regional currencies are probably a bad idea unless there is perfect mobility of labor. And what they realized in Europe is that you just don't have that due to language differences. It works well in the US. We have a regional currency among the 50 states, which was not always the case, but we have a single US dollar but we also have a lot of migration of labor within the U.S. that facilitates the rebalancing of the economy. So, you know, could a regional currency work in, in Latin America? It might, because you do have the common language, but there are, you know, capital and labor market controls that would be, I think, a real challenge to the success. Now, the second half of your question about the social media companies, I think that's exactly where this is going. Um, the reason that China is issuing a central bank digital currency is because of the success of Alipay and WeChat Pay, which are two social media slash retail companies that have more or less taken over monetary policy in the second largest economy in the world. I think um, Facebook, Amazon, Google, and so forth have seen the success, especially of Ant Financial, the, the financial arm of Alibaba that has launched essentially its own currency system with Alipay. The DM project under Facebook has taken a lot of heat, and I think they made a mistake by sticking their necks out and that the real threat comes from Amazon and Google. Um, I'm not sure many of you saw this story, but Amazon advertised a job opening about 10 days ago for a head of digital currency at Amazon. And my expectation is that in the future, you will see the real currency issuers not being sovereign governments, but being these global media companies with billions of customers, very robust IT, and high degrees of customer loyalty and engagement. So for better or for worse, I think you'll probably use the Google dollar, the Amazon dollar, or something like that in the not too distant future. This will be a huge challenge to public finance around the world. Um, this is not you know, some regional currency, this is something that has 10 times the customer base of the Federal Reserve. And I think this needs to be taken very seriously. What can be done to stop it or whether it should be stopped, I think are, you know, two very interesting questions, but I think this is coming very, very quickly. And it may, you know, completely change the game for everybody. And, and, and likely also to perhaps even have, you know, beneficial uh, effects as well for financial inclusion where, in a region in La like Latin America, where some countries, you know, have seventy percent of their population is unbanked, uh, perhaps this gives them a chance as but, well. But yeah, all of these people have smartphones. They do, and it's you know whether Jeff Bezos can do a better job of money creation than the Federal Reserve is a very interesting question, and I'm not sure the answer isn't yes. Um, but you know, we'll, we may be there sooner sooner than you think. I bet. Well, David, this has been so wonderful. Um, I am just so pleased with the turnout and of, of our first YPA Crypto 101. It is now 11 a.m. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining. This has been uh, truly remarkable, and and you've been you know remarkable in your presentation and on your comments and your insights. And we look forward to hopefully having you back. Uh, this is going to be an, an ongoing series. I know that your your colleague uh, Drew Hinkis was supposed to uh, join today. He couldn't at the end, but, um, um, but but we look forward to continuing the partnership with NYU Stern and and continuing certainly the conversation, the Council of the Americas, and of course in YPA. So thank you, thank you so much, and thank you everybody. Thank you very much, and.
Let me just add one quick closing word. I am so glad that nobody asked me to predict the future price of Bitcoin. In fact, nobody talked about speculation at all. And I, I think that that's terrific because you know much more interested in the monetary use of these assets. <laughs> I bet, yes. I, what do you predict then? Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I know that I don't know. But I can tell you it's very risky and don't put your life savings in, in crypto. A flash question to you. What do you what are your thoughts on meme coins like dog coin that have captured so many uh so many interests about making a short term profit? Yeah, I've had so many conversations with my kids about meme finance. And um I think the younger generation looks at this very differently than we do. And I, I don't expect Dogecoin to stand the test of time, but on the other hand, if enough people use it and you know, Generation X or Gen Z thinks that this is more reliable than the dollar, it can't be written off. I mean, you know, it raises very interesting questions about what makes for a successful currency. What's the nature of money? I bet, yes, I, I, I totally agree. Well, thank you, David. Thank you so much right. for your thank time you, everybody. and your insights. And, and thanks everybody for joining.